Jeff, uh, very welcome to the series of the uh, new institute interviews called uh, Work in Progress from the construction side of the new institute, uh, the future side of the new institute in Hamburg. Um, we expect less noise throughout the interview, but this is uh, an ongoing construction site and uh, we'll, we'll manage even with a little noise in the background. Um, I'm very happy to talk to you today. Uh, you're the senior advisor at the New Institute, the professor for, and I love this, uh, collective intelligence, public policy and uh, social innovation, the former director of policy for Tony Blair at Downing Street Number 10, and currently a fellow as well at the Demos Helsinki think tank. Uh, you're a prolific writer and an inquisitive mind. Uh, most recently you have focused on the topic of imagination, exploring it in all sorts of exciting ways, developing a set of ideas that is highly relevant to what we want to do here at the New Institute, um, because we want to reach beyond the status quo, not only imagining but also creating a framework for a different society. So um, lots to talk about in the next roughly 45 minutes. Um, so let's dive right in um, with the big one. How does change happen? <laughs> <clears throat> well, in lots and lots of different ways, sometimes slowly, sometimes suddenly. And uh, in the past, I've tried to, in many ways, make sense of um, uh, of patterns of change and the role of ideas, the role of social dynamics, the role of technologies and how they interact. But one of the reasons I became interested in imagination uh, recently was because perhaps there was a missing piece in, in the theories of change I was finding. Uh, and in the past, one of the things which allowed change was people thinking ahead to a better possible society, a utopia, or imagining everyone having the vote, or imagining a welfare state, or imagining universal health care. And my worry is that at the moment, that kind of imagination has almost disappeared compared to 50 years ago, or 100 years ago, 150 years ago, that many people can picture a much worse world in 50 years' time, particularly with climate change, ecological catastrophe, robots taking over the world, populist demagogues running every country. That's an easy thing for people to imagine. Or they can imagine technology transforming the world with uh, you know, drones and flying taxis and AI everywhere. But in terms of a social picture, very few people can give an articulate account of how the world might be better socially a generation or two into the future. What might our healthcare look like, our primary schools, our libraries, our, our parliaments? And part of the reason is that I think the institutions which should be working on this imagination have largely vacated that space. Political parties, universities, think tanks, all for slightly different reasons. And I think this has become part of almost a pathology of our time that we cannot see a desirable, plausible future to build towards. And so we turn instead to fear or perhaps into our private lives or just into opposition rather than creation. And so, yeah, change has many, many factors which allow change to happen, not just imagination, but without some sense of where you're going, it's very hard to get there. We'll dive into all these uh, areas, the institutions and the reasons for this lack of um, energy or, or ambition to, to look beyond the status quo. But just this first answer already showed so this quite always compelling energy and this optimism in your um, approach. Um, can you explain that a little, your personal sort of view on that? I mean, you come from a background which is fairly institutional in some way. Is that somehow connected to seeing the shortcomings or pathologies of institutions or wanting to break free? Or is it just a very personal view of how sort of life could be lived more fulfilled and, 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 and rich? Well, I guess in, in my personal life, I've had half my career basically as an activist from the grassroots upwards. From about the age of 14, I used to organize marches and pickets and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, and I remained involved in community organizing and social entrepreneurship and so sort of trying to find solutions from the bottom up. And I've spent the other half of my life working from the top down in, in governments around the world or the European Commission. I work with the UN now. And 
To some extent, nearly all change has to involve some alliance of the top down and the bottom up, the powerless and the powerful. I sometimes call them the bees and the trees, the bees, the people with the ideas, the trees, the big institutions with power uh, and, uh, and, and money. And I guess I get some optimism from having seen how often from both ends, and especially when they come together, you can transform things completely. Uh, I guess the great lesson I've learned or relearned again and again is that we often overestimate how much can change short term. Not many big things can change in a year or two or three years, but equally most people underestimate how much can change over one, two or three decades. And in so many fields, I mean, I've seen far reaching transformation over the course of a generation. Much of my, my PhD is in telecom, so I've been involved in the digital world much of my life, which really has you know, changed how we... We, we shop and uh, interact with friends and family and so on, far more in many ways than people uh, expected. So that's what gives me some, and obviously in bad ways as well as good ways, that, but that's what gives me some optimism that in a way the fatalism now, the sense that you can't fix these problems, it's all too difficult, it's all going to disaster, I think is unrealistic. Uh, and there's nothing worse than an unrealistic fatalism because it then undermines the energy, the capacity to do the practical changes, which, of course, won't solve climate change in 2022. But actually, over 20, 30 years, I think it's entirely plausible we will completely transform our economy and society. One of the institutions that you focus on in one of the papers that you wrote, um, also for the New Institute, is uh, the university and you make some very sweeping um, assumptions or claims about uh, a very long tradition actually of um, sort of destroying the future in some way or murdering uh, somehow the future that's in another paper I think you use that drastic phrase um, or murdering imagination um, could you sort of dive into these um, thought concepts that you find, I think, inherently connected also in some way with the version of progress or modernity, um, starting with positivism and quantification and all that. So if it's, it reaches much farther back, your criticism of, of the lack of, um, I guess, ambition or imagination on, on parts of, of universities or in that specific paper, social science. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite a complicated story, and I'm mainly focused on social sciences because in some ways it's a very different story for engineering and, uh, and the other sciences. But in the social sciences, the fundamental question is, if you are an academic, and I am one now, how much of your job is to understand the present and the past, and how much of your job is to try to design options for the future? Now, in the 19th century, in the early days of social science, it was kind of assumed you did both. All the great, you know, thinkers tried to understand the dynamics of change and of and of society and economy, but also to picture, you know, where the world uh, might be heading, and often to be advocates then of what should be done. You know, to take one example, a sister institution in London, the London School of Economics, was very much formed as a as a place for academics to work on designing future health systems, welfare states, etc., etc., not just to uh, write books and, and, and analyse what had gone wrong. Now, for a whole series of reasons, over the last 50 or 60 years, in many ways, the social science have become lopsided. They've become almost quite fearful of designing the future. It's almost career-threatening to do too much of that. And as you said in your, your, your comments, some of this is about the, in, in many ways, quite welcome rise of attention to data, to em empirical analysis, to looking at the facts and not just purely speculative social science. That's in many ways been good. It's made for much more rigorous understanding of the present and the past, but it squeezed out creativity uh, for the future. There's also been, of course, the disappointment with the grand ideological projects of the last century, which led a whole wave of intellectuals to move into critique rather than creative construction. And it's a much safer place to be critiquing all that's wrong with capitalism rather than trying to propose uh, alternatives 
uh, uh, to it. And so we've had many, many forces um, converging. Now, there are some social scientists who do work on design, but it tends to be very micro or very incremental. So there's, for example, an interesting field of mechanism design on social problems, which is you know, quite interesting, but it's, it's tiny non-systemic solutions rather than addressing the big structural and systemic issues of, of power and money and so on in the world. So I believe there is actually a need to recover a bit of that older tradition of social science, but ally it to the best tools we have now, whether it's you know, data and models and experiments and so on, and encourage the social sciences to consciously be creative and to do what I call exploratory social science, which tries to, in some ways, do three things simultaneously. One is to really use the knowledge base, the evidence uh, which has been gathered, to try to be logical and coherent, but also to be creative and learn methods from design and the arts and other fields which do creativity as a matter of course. Weirdly, a field like economics, as far as I can tell, and I've asked many people, has taken almost no methods from any other field, including from business, uh, in terms of its own creativity. So there's a real so intellectual, I don't know, narrow-mindedness, lack of curiosity, lack of hunger in the social sciences. At a, at a time when, say, creativity methods are so widely used in everything from film and design to products uh, and services, it's a sort of it's almost a remarkable lack of um, willingness to design the future. And so my hope is we will see in universities centres of exploratory social science which try to be as good at rigour as they are at imagination. And a final point is one of the prompts for that paper was a weird paradox that I've again and again found the people with really deep knowledge of a topic, um, you know, which could be forests or it could be you know, how to run um, health services, are often really scared of saying what they would like the world to be like in 20, 30, 40 years' time. There are, on the other hand, there are lots of people who do do sort of futurism and speculation, but they tend not to have the depth of knowledge that you need to have really useful insights into how those systems can work. So we have this sort of paradoxical situation with the people with the deepest knowledge, not doing the creativity, and vice versa. And hopefully that can be solved. Hopefully the new institute can be part of showing that you can be deep, rigorous, you know, uh, in touch with all that a discipline like psychology, economics, sociology have, have learned, but also creative at the same time. It is very surprising, as you say, um, that a failure of um, imagination or future thinking uh, on, broadly speaking, I would say, both the left and the right, and maybe we can linger a, a moment there. Um, I mean, as you say, it's sort of the left um, has critical theory as a tool, sort of uh, adopted, as you also write in your paper, as a reaction maybe to the failure of these grand narratives in some ways. So, so that is not a very future-oriented um, endeavor, critique, critical theory. And, and the right, if broadly speaking, is maybe um, beholden to something that Mark Fisher, that whom you also quote in one of your papers, called capitalist realism, um, sort of living in the moment, destroying in a way counterintuitively uh, any, any notion of future or handing it over to the notion of growth, which is not future producing, but something different. Can you, can you explore that dilemma um, a, a bit? Well, I think the politics of this is, is, is fascinating and quite complicated. So traditionally, of course, the conservative right was skeptical of any designs for the future, because by definition, what exists has been tried through history and therefore is thought to be superior to the, you know, the, the scribblings of some intellectual. Whereas the left was the opposite and, uh, you know, was believed in utopias and designs and the idea that the future will be better than, uh, than the past. Now, for a time, in a way, they swapped places. As you say, the left became you know, disappointed with particularly really existing Marxism, uh, turned to uh, uh, critique. Uh, and for a period, the right almost filled the left's uh, place in the in the 80s and 90s, the times of um, Margaret Thatcher, Reagan, Gingrich in America. A lot of conservatives became almost more utopian than the left. You know, they, they pictured a future of everything run by markets, often supported by technologies, 
which was a sort of slightly crazed uh, uh, enthusiasm for the design of the future. And then in the last 20 years, they've essentially returned back to a much more traditional uh, conservative positions, perhaps symbolized by, you know, Trump, make America great again, uh, a return to nostalgic uh, pictures of, of race and community and manufacturing based economies. But the left is still in uh, its rather sort of fearful state. And this leads to a very odd phenomenon in book publishing, which is that if you read the books of, of either right or left, actually, or, or any of them which are purporting to be making recommendations on policy, they tend to be sort of 10 chapters of analysis, sometimes brilliant, and then one chapter at the end with a few proposals, which tend to be banal especially the ones from the left and the centre-left. There's a sort of fairly standard mix of things about you know, welfare and skills and so on, but absolutely unimaginative. And I think this is a symptom of both what I was talking about earlier, that the university, the, the academy has lost the methods for much more radical thinking ahead, and perhaps just the political fear of being exposed by having genuinely novel, genuinely challenging ideas. And you're much more likely to make it as a public intellectual reviving old ideas than coming up with new ones. And I won't name names, but nearly all the people who have the most prominence in the last three or four years, for example, are essentially revivers of ideas from the 70s or the 50s or the 20s rather than anything, anything new, which is pretty disappointing because I think we need some really bold, radical thinking in this century if we're going to cope with climate change, with AI, with the threats to democracy, you name it. And our intellectuals, I think, are not serving us that well. You have this wonderful quote in the paper that we live in a golden age of diagnosis, but in a dark age when it comes to imaginative prescription. Um, so that is uh, the age of conformity, as you also call it. Um, I guess that's what we're living in. Um, and I think, as you pointed out, that ideally we at the New Institute would be a place for really radical rethinking. Um, what would be the methods? You just spell out some, some areas. Uh, maybe you can sort of dive into one or two of them. Experimentation, complexity thinking, design plays a, plays a huge role in your um, thinking. Um, futures, future world making. Sort of, can you explore some of the the most sort of for you fruitful or promising pathways or tools to to get that radical step um, further? Well, there are some very simple methods you can use just to free up uh, thinking, and the, the ones which I mean, I, I've I've used for for many years, but and I think are a, a good starting point. Now, some is quite simple ones which um, you can use for almost any phenomenon. And it could be imagining your local library or childcare or rural bus services. And then you go through a series of essentially sort of transformations to it. So what would happen if you extended, you know, one aspect of it radically in the way that, for example, we've extended ideas of rights in the last 50 years to cover everything from the biosphere and animals to transgender, etc. So extension is always a, a, a useful uh, idea. What happens if you invert things, if you transform roles, so they, 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 they swap around in the way that, let's say, in microcredit, you know, the farmers became bankers uh, rather than the bankers, or patients become doctors, or students become learners, or grafting. Can you take an idea from a very different field and try and apply it to your library or your childcare, your bus service. Anyway, there's a whole series of these, which almost any group can, can use pretty quickly to come up with other options. Now, that's just the starting point. You then, of course, this is where the, the deep knowledge comes in, have to start you know, thinking about building your world, your designs, and seeing how plausible they are, what might be a, an evolutionary route for them to, uh, to spread. And always one's trying to find a balance between the willingness to, to leap ahead and jump beyond what is realistic now to what might be possible in 20 years' time, and not to fall prey to what I call unrealistic realism. And it's a striking thing that many academic disciplines are always very good at explaining why change won't happen. And then when it does come, I have no way of explaining why it did happen uh, because of their unrealistic realism. So avoiding that but also not avoiding sort of fantasy and illusion and, and, and designs or ideas which have absolutely no plausible prospect uh, of ever happening. And that's, that's quite a difficult thing to do. But I would like to see you know, in universities cross-disciplinary teams uh, 
becoming good at yeah creating these alternative worlds interrogating them seeing what you know what their implications are what their economic base might be their legitimacy and so on and i think this is a crucial point i think every society needs some sense of where it might be headed in the future in order to be healthy just as we do as in individuals you know, if you have no idea of anything better which might happen in your life in a year's time, a nice holiday, a better job, I don't know, yeah, something great in your relationship, it's pretty hard to live well in the present. And I think this, the same is true of societies. Germany, of course, has had a, you know, deep debates about how you come to terms with your past and really understand your past in order to live better in the present. But I think there's an exact equivalent for the future, that we need a, some shared pictures of where we could be headed 30, 50, 70 years into the future, which aren't only ecological disaster or sort of technological determinist triumph. And that's the missing space in our, I think, our collective imaginaries, which we really need to address, because the downside of not having it is that all sorts of other dark forces may fill that space instead. You start describing very practical aspects of, of um how change could happen. And I think that's an interesting point that you make in, in your paper and you point to Hilary Cotton or Kate Warworth, among others, of that for a lot of people who come up with transformative ideas and imaginative concepts of how to rethink, for example, economy in the case of Kate Warworth, they come from a practical background. They, they've worked in different organizations, uh, the UN or, or on the fields. Um, is that key in the sort of process of creating alternative futures? practical understanding? Yeah, I guess many of the people I, I most respect are the ones who have engaged in practice. Uh, and often, weirdly, they're more optimistic than ones who just still sit in an ivory tower observing because they will have experienced that change does happen and, and it is possible. And one of the things I've become very interested in, which you mentioned earlier, is, is experimentalism, which is really the idea, instead of trying to come up with a perfect blueprint and then take over the state and then impose your blueprint on the whole of society, which perhaps was the Marxist dream 100 years ago, instead, you try things out. You develop designs and concepts and possibilities and try them out and see through reality what works or what doesn't. So the circular economy is a, is a great example of that. It's an idea which has been around for several decades now, the idea of an economy, you know, which is ideally zero waste and zero carbon and reuses things. And that's now been experimented in all over the world, from Japan and Finland to China, where the Chinese Communist Party adopted it as a policy 15 years ago. And as a result, we've now got a much denser set of knowledge about what that might mean for plastics or glass or fashion or paper and so on. Or take, you know, welfare reform. Um, universal basic income has been, again, a fashionable idea for several decades. I was always fairly skeptical of it. But in the last few years, many places have tried experimenting with it. Uh, and indeed, in the last year, because of the COVID crisis, there have been sort of quasi-experiments in UBI all over the world. And a lot has been learned. And for me, one of the really interesting messages of those experiments is that it doesn't seem to disincentivize work, as some expected. And it has good, very strong effects on anxiety, which is kind of obvious. If you can feel confident you're not about to go into extreme hardship as a family, you're going to be happier, less anxious. And we know that anxiety has all sorts of physical and mental, uh, mental downsides. So I've actually become rather more favourable to versions of UBI, but it's only through experiment that we find out. And so my, I, I've long believed that you know, a, a good 21st century government is constantly trying things out, learning from them, improving them, uh, before putting them into legislation and national programs. And that is now you know, widely accepted, at least in some parts of the world, that that's how you should do things. Um, and, uh, and in many fields, practice is ahead of theory, is perhaps the other crucial point to make. So when that is the case, almost the role of the academic is to make sense of the practice rather than perhaps in the 19th century model, believing that some philosopher sitting in a university will come up with a great idea, which then in a linear way goes out into society to be implemented. I think in many fields, exactly the opposite is the model we now need to understand, where the innovators on the front line, 
in everything from software and data to things like welfare, are often thinking in more productive, more profoundly radical ways than the theorists. And the theorists need to be a bit more humble and try and use their skills to make sense of, pull together, give coherence to what's happening on the ground. And someone like Kate Rayworth, I would say, you know, what she's done really well is to weave together a whole host of different streams of practice and turn them into a framework. Very little, and she wouldn't claim this, very little she's done is novel, but she's made sense of a huge range of radical practices uh, around the world. And that's a very, very useful thing to do. Practitioners on the front lines, um, that's um, something to remember. And it's, I think, particularly interesting in these two fields that you find relevant, or that will be, I guess, determining the 21st century, it's digitalization and um, climate or, or decarbonization in, in, in that matter. And then those are two areas, obviously, as you say, where in technology, uh, practitioners are far, far ahead from any theory, uh, of any theory, and uh, the same for climate change. There's basically just, <laughs> there's no theory for climate change. There's just, uh, just practice, <laughs> um, or there's an attempt to rationalize or economically sort of model what could be done. But um, how, what's your optimism in these two fields, um, which you sort of clearly say these are the fields where change does not only needs to happen, but, but sort of opens up really new potentials for, for alternative, again, or, or, or better futures? Well, we're, we're in a very paradoxical position at the moment. Just today, the UK government committed to much faster decarbonation decarbonisation plans that it had uh, before, which is good. And yet also right at the moment, we're witnessing the most rapid increase in carbon emissions possibly in human history as the world bounces out of COVID. Uh, and so it's quite hard to make sense of how pessimistic or optimistic to be. 20 years ago, I, I had to oversee the UK's first carbon reduction strategy up, up to 2050 when I was running the strategy unit. So I got very you know, immersed in the details of uh, you know, different energy uses and transport and housing. And in fact, we were much too modest on our ambitions uh, then. A part of me, therefore, is quite glad to see how much this is part of the zeitgeist now. But another part of me is almost horrified how much investment is still going into fossil fuels. One of the crucial missing bits, though, I think is on this connection between the digital world and the climate change world. So one relatively good thing is, at least in theory, the world of finance and investment has started taking these things much more seriously. Big investors like BlackRock, the Pope, the former governor of the Bank of England is making this his mission to ensure that investment is much more you know, attuned to carbon. The European Investment Bank is ending all fossil fuel investment this year, at least they claim. On the other hand, the digital industry, which now dominates our economy, most of the most valuable companies in the world are digital, like Apple and Amazon and Alibaba and so on. They're playing almost no role at all in, in climate change and decarbonisation. And one of the things I think we will need in the next 10 or 20 years in cities like London and Hamburg and Helsinki is really a radical reorganisation of how we structure uh, the data around carbon, the AI and algorithms around carbon, as well as the behaviours of, uh, of, of homeowners and drivers and businesses. And in, in, in a nutshell, I think we have to leap to creating public commons of data on, uh, on carbon, uh, run and governed at a, at a public level, rather than proprietary ownership of these by electricity companies or, uh, say, housing providers or transport companies. And we need a much more systematic organization, the knowledge needed to introduce heat pumps into homes or neighborhood energy systems and so on. And it's, there's a weird divide at the moment between the digital world and the kind of ecological climate change world. They don't really talk to each other very much. And if you look at the strategies at a city level or a national level, they're just not joined up uh, at all. Uh, and this, I think, is a soluble problem, but it's one we really need to get to work on pretty quickly. And perhaps if, if there isn't change, start shaming the companies like Facebook and Google and Amazon for just how little they are contributing now to the world's biggest challenge. Because many of the methods they use as a matter of course in their businesses are exactly what we need to achieve dramatically faster reduction of emissions in our, sorry, in our homes and our industries.
And that's actually one of the most promising programs, I think, here at the new Institute so that you're also involved in is that exact that that sort of on the local level, city level, uh, data driven uh, sustainability effort. And I think that's very promising. The new Hansa um, program here at the Institute. Um, is that also somehow connected to sort of this thinking of um, how to implement change or how to sort of form alliances around change to this term that I found so fascinating, this dialectical imagination. So if you said there's uh, some flow uh, with the, uh, with the, so you go with the grain or against the grain or both with the grain and against the grain, which would be the dialectical approach. Can you unpack that concept? Yeah, so we're not just looking back at the last 150 years, I guess, at social imagination. I was very struck that in a way, you have three options of how you imagine. But option one, you, as you say, you go with the grain of the dominant technologies, the dominant powers. So a good example of that now would be classic smart city ideas of the kind Google and others promote. It just goes with the grain. Uh, it doesn't challenge them at all. You just have more data, more AI, more sensors, more of everything. The second option is the opposite. You resist, you try to promote perhaps, you know, just blocking them or crushing them, perhaps going back to the land, back to a much more traditional um, ecological lifestyle. You see all of that as, as, as evil. And the dialectical, the third option, it always in some ways goes with the grain while also challenging it. Now, Marx did that definitely in the 19th century. He was in some ways, you know, infused by the new technologies of of industrial capitalism, but also wanted to completely uh, transform them. I think much modern green thinking is dialectical in that sense too. It wants to make the most of using technological innovation, but directed to uh, renewable energy or, 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 or sort of uh, new, new kinds of, of transport. And that dialectical spirit, I think, needs to almost inform everything we do to, to see in the emergent tools of, of the world as it is now, extraordinary possibility, but not to take them for granted, to challenge them, especially where they're creating new concentrations of power, new kinds of predatory power, or of course, creating harms like ecological harms. And so that's why, yeah, I advocate this dialectical spirit as something which should run through everything we do with and against the grain simultaneously. You mentioned the word power, which is, I guess, relative in every uh, concept of change, um, but also how uh, sort of knowledge is formed in some way. And you're a professor for collective intelligence, and you talk about the hive, hive mind. I guess a few dec a decade or two ago, you would have said it's the wisdom of the crowd. That's something that's no longer so so fashionable because the also the folly of the crowd has been rediscovered, um, which was never, I think, far from reality anyway. So, so could you sort of explore um, that, as you say, sort of the importance of shared imagination, so to create new and shared realities, and how is that connected to your, to your work at the UCL? So my interest in collective intelligence emerged about, about 15 years ago. Um, I guess I come from a digital background and then was observing how the internet was making it possible to organize huge numbers of people on projects of intelligence. Citizen science is a good example, you know, finding new stars or tracking uh, what's happening in nature, making it possible to reorganize democracy uh, so that through online platforms, far more people could take part in proposing ideas, commenting, improving on them and so on. And within business, companies like Lego or, or Siemens in Germany using what I call collective intelligence methods to involve their consumers or their workers in decision making in a way completely unlike, you know, centuries old hierarchical uh, management. So I think what's been interesting in the last few years is this whole field has become much more developed and much more sophisticated. It certainly doesn't believe that crowds are automatically wise. Of course, they're not. They can be utterly stupid or deluded uh, or crazed. It all depends on how you organize them and the detail of the structures. But I think we are seeing, you know, a, a beginnings of a realization. This is part of almost any uh, both practical but also political program for the future. The last year has been extraordinary in this respect. 
what happened globally in the global science system around COVID is a perfect expression of collective intelligence. 100,000 plus science papers written, nearly all of them collaborations, huge, these sophisticated networks of collaboration between on, on vaccines or on treatments or on PPE or on social solutions. And I'm, I'm involved in running run one part of this. We are trying to help the world's mind be connected and organized in ways which were unthinkable a generation ago. In democracy, places like Taiwan are applying that to everyday decision making. And again, showing you can open up decision making to the expertise as well as the, the views and opinions of your people. And if you do that in the, the right way, you get the opposite effect to Twitter and Facebook. You don't get polarization. You don't empower the loudest, the most extrovert. You get more thoughtful, more deliberation, more, more high uh, quality decision making. And in cities, we're beginning to see uh, you know, fascinating use of collective intelligence methods by city leaders to help them solve problems. There's one of the mayors of one of the biggest cities in Italy, um, tomorrow helping you know, launch his uh, re-election campaign uh, around collective intelligence. And many others are realizing that's the greatest you know, resource of any city is not just its buildings and its railways. It's how you tap into the brain power of your million, five million, ten million uh, people. And in the last few years, we've been obsessed with AI in some ways for good reasons. And I've, I've been pretty involved in artificial intelligence. But I hope as much effort in the next 10 years goes into the human sort of version of that, which is human collective intelligence, because most complex tasks we face um, cannot be fixed on their own by algorithms. They will always, always, nearly always be some combination of large scale human intelligence and algorithmic intelligence. And I think for radicals, this needs to be part of really a political story for the future, that the future doesn't just lie in technocratic leaders making decisions for the people and expecting them to be grateful. It has to be governance with the people all the time, tapping into their knowledge, their experience, their expertise, and in a very systematic way, looping that into how decisions are made rather than just every few years once there's an election. And I think a lot of the smarter young politicians get this and realize just how radical an idea uh, it can be if you take it seriously. No, it's fascinating, fascinating potential, I think, to uh, reinvent all sorts of uh, democratic processes. Um, what's the role of, of art in all of that? I mean, you have another really interesting paper that says so if you need the combination or the combination of science and art is necessary or, or leads to the change in how you see things. And that's to quote Ursula Le Guin, the, the great speculative fiction writer. So if you, to get a revolution, you need to first um, um, have it, you need to be the revolution. It's in your spirit or it's nowhere. So I, I think that's the quote from her great novel, The Dispossessed. Um, can you, can you, and you also, also said so this word collaboration already, so if, um, your, your paper about art's role in reimagining our societies is quite nuanced and um, open and complex um, because you say it's not the God-like position of the artist, but it's more of how they, how they work and, and that maybe also is related to this work, work collaboration. Can, can you, so if, Un unpack your ideas, uh, your thinking about art's role in um, changing or reimagining our societies. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I, I love art and I spend a lot of time with artists, so, um, uh, but I found myself troubled by a, 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 a sort of odd question. So often artists talk about themselves as the trailblazers of future imagination. And they say, we're the people who can see the future and can unlock the evils of the present. And for part of me is sympathetic to that. And then you look in detail and say, well, actually, are they doing that? Where in the last 50 years has any artwork, whether a visual art or a novel or a film, actually portrayed a desirable future society, 20, 40, 60 years into the future. And it turns out there have been almost none. Ursula Gwynne's book, The Dispossessed, is one of the very last which did back in the 60s. In the early 70s, there were a few. But since then, art has almost, vac again, vacated that space of positive imagination. There are a few exceptions, but they tend to have pretty small audiences. And it's been much better at describing dystopias, 
uh, ecological catastrophes again or technology out of control than it has at, at serving sort of social thought. Now, of course, arts can play a very powerful role in challenging and bearing witness and undermining. You know, what happened this last few months with the Robert E. Lee statue in, in Virginia is a great example of that. Uh, and around many things around the Black Lives Matter movement have been great examples of art with a social movement. But it's not art imagining something which doesn't exist into the future. So in this paper, I try and explore this in some detail and try to be a bit nuanced because it is a complicated picture. And I guess I end up by saying, actually, artists shouldn't pretend they are the prophets of the future. They shouldn't pretend, as the poet Shelley did 200 years ago, that they're the unacknowledged legislators of the world. That slightly pompous view of the sort of godlike artist seeing into the future, I think is a bit anachronistic. What they can do is help us to see things in a very different way. And, uh, and in the paper, I go through lots of examples of this around ecology or data and artificial intelligence, where amazing artists are helping us observe, transform our perceptions, and they can challenge and they can bear witness. But it's then for someone else to do the job of thinking through, OK, well, what does that possibly mean for how we look after children or, or how we organise our energy or how we... Um, we organise our democracy. We shouldn't expect the artists to do that. And that's why I say they should try and be prophets at a tangent. As soon as they become too prescriptive or too didactic, they become a bit banal or boring or not very interesting or not very good at either as art or as social commentary. So I suspect my argument will annoy lots of people both in the arts and in other fields. But it's, I just heard so many times these slightly spurious claims about their role in future imagination that I just wanted to dig a little bit and see if it was really as convincing as all that. But clearly your heart is in it, or, or I would be interested in where your heart is. I mean, you, you mentioned the romantics of the late 18th, early 19th century, and their as you say, the world of energy and flux. Is that where you are? Is that where you want to be? Well, in this paper, I point out that one of the fantastic things art can do is almost through its methods, allow us to see a different kind of world. So the very best you know, music of the last 150 years doesn't tell us how to design our health system. But it may show us new ways of combining dissonance and consonance, for example, or order and chaos. Uh, and seeing that allows us to imagine perhaps an equivalent in our society where there might be radically greater diversity. And what appears at first glance like chaos and disorder, but actually makes sense in a larger picture of order. It's that sort of metaphor, metaphorical thinking, which only art can do, actually. And which I think is really powerful and really useful. And at the moment, the way in which art is exploring both the very sort of micro world, you know, getting into into cells or understanding of genes and the sort of macro world of the cosmos, there it again, it explodes our senses and allows us to see our own world in radically fresh ways, which then are the spark for social imagination, but they're not the social imagination itself. And so that's the sense in which I really would you know, encourage everyone to immerse themselves in the leading edges of art. I, I love seeing collaborations of artists working with people involved in social change or activists and innovators and so on. Um, all I'm saying is that they shouldn't sort of believe they can do things in those projects which they can't do. It is not their job to visualize probably uh, the welfare state of Germany in 2070, and if they do, it'll be boring. Uh, but their job is to help us see other human beings and technologies and our, and, and our systems in fresh ways, which, which then break us free from really the tyranny of the present, which makes us always see things as more fixed, less plastic than they really are. Well, not in, in, in that spirit, I think I'll just um, go out now and uh, revolutionize what I can. Um, it was a pleasure, as always, to talk to you. Um, can't wait for this pandemic to be over and uh, get to work in Hamburg and other, other places. And um, thank you so much. I think the atmosphere was already constructive in a quite physical way here in the um, construction side. So um, I hope the quality was as good as the conversation, um, thank you, um, Jeff, and uh, let's get to work. Thank you. Thank you, Gerald. I, th I think there's a famous quote by Brecht when he said,
all great works of art are never completed. So you will probably be on an uncompleted work site for the next few decades, I hope. I hope so too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.